Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from one of the pastors here at the Rock. Well, this is such an honor for us. Um, let's go ahead and open up in prayer. If you all want to stand with me for a second. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just commit this time to you, and we thank you, Father, for all that you're doing in the lives of each one of these families here, Father. Father, we thank you for the parents that have come tonight, Father, to glean more wisdom on how to raise their children, and we thank you, Father, for those that uh, are believing to be parents, Father. We thank you for them, and that they've come tonight, Father, and that they're, they're, we're eagerly waiting to hear from you, Father God, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. I wanted to uh, draw your attention to this little, little handout that they were supposed to give you when you came in. Everybody got one? Okay, it, there's just a list of resources in there for you uh, of different parenting things. We, some of the pastors have got together and said that this is the, these are some of the favorite scriptures that they wanted to make sure that you were aware of and some resources, some books, and some things like that that you can go to. Apologize for there not being any online things. I don't believe we have anything in there that is an online resource, but most everything is online in addition to what you see. So anyway, just wanted to do that. Well, as a point of introduction, like Pastor Dan said, uh, my name is Pastor Mike Bryan, and this is my wife, Pastor Sue, and we've been here for 20 years, and it's been indeed a pleasure being here. The church is Man, it has grown, 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 and so we are just so blessed to be a part of that and to be able to be entrusted to be over such an amazing children's ministry team. You guys like the children's ministry team that's here? You know, they're just an incredible group of individuals that God brought to us. And so, anyway, with all of that, you know, we, um, we just encourage you, if you have not been bringing your children over there, please do. Because we know how to reach children right where they itch, where they can understand the Word of God at their level. And so it's very important for you to do that. If you have a new baby, then we encourage you, once your child gets old enough to where you feel secure about dropping them off over there, all of our workers have had just uh, tremendous background checks and training and all of that. So uh, just making a plug for the children's ministry right now. Amen? Amen. Well, um, I'm going to share a couple of, of points myself. We've decided to call tonight, who is the parent? Who's the parent? And so we're gonna, uh, I'm going to share a few points on it, and then I'm going to switch over and let my wife finish it off. But, uh, but you know, it, it's really important for us to know, of course, who the parent is. I'm just curious here, uh, how many of you are parents in this place? All right, Hallelujah. You know, parenting is really a cool thing. But one thing we realize, the very first thing that you need to realize as a parent, I believe, is you need to realize and recognize, number one, that children, your children, are a gift from God. Your children are a gift from God. And I'd like to draw your attention to Psalm chapter 127, verse 3. Psalm 127, verse 3. And it says this. It says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Now, that's a good thing, right, just, just by itself, right? The fruit of the womb is a reward. That means that children are a heritage. Not only is the children, did God give you a child, but he sent it. It's his inheritance as well. You know, your children belong to him, just like they belong to you. They came from him, and, uh, you know, they, they've been entrusted to you. And then it goes on to say, the fruit of the womb is a reward. And then verse 4, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Wow. Wow. Now, you think about that as arrows in the hand of a warrior. Now, maybe you've heard this scripture before, and maybe you understand everything about it. But one thing that's kind of interesting is he's kind of painted us a picture 
of a, of a warrior without arrows. You know, what it is is, uh, in order for a warrior to be powerful, to be strong, back in this day when, when the main uh, weapon that they used was, was bow and arrow, uh, in order for a warrior to be strong, he had to have his quiver full of arrows. And so, you know, it says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. You, we would equate it today in maybe the, the sense of going into battle. If you were to be going into a battle back then with no arrows, you would be very helpless. Uh, today, it would be going into a battle without any bullets for your gun. You know, just to draw it into a little more relevance. And so, the fact is, is that he's saying that happy is happy is the man who has his quiver full of them, verse 5. You know, they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. He's telling us that children are a gift from him, a gift from God. Children are entrusted to us. Now, what we've heard through the years of being working with children is many times people aren't even happy that they have children. <laughs> you know, they didn't, let alone think that they're from God. You know, if a, if a child rubs them the wrong way or sometimes uh, they'll have a child that just didn't quite seem to fit in their family and so it's always been an a, a extra special chore for them in raising their child and they go, that child's from God? Yes. The Bible says that children are a gift from God. They're on loan for you for a short time, but he's going to help you. He's going to, um, he's put them in your care, but he's going to help you. He's going to bless you as you put him first place in raising your kids. Now, our job is to train them up and to protect them. Sometimes we have to work real hard to do that, right, along the way. Now, this is a quote from Albert Siegel that says, this is kind of interesting. It says, when it comes to rearing children, every society is only 20 years away from barbarism. 20 years is all we have to accomplish the task of civilizing the infants born into our midst each year. These savages know nothing of our language, our culture, our religion, our values, our customs, our interpersonal relationships, the infant is totally ignorant of communism, fascism, democracy, civil liberties, respect, decently, decency, honesty, or manners. So a child comes in not knowing any of these things. And it's our responsibility as parents to get them into the right mode so that they believe the way that they're supposed to, to be productive in our society and in life and to understand the good parts here. Godly parents can make a difference in the future of society. Amen? Sometimes this means that for you, you have to stand your ground and you need to, to kick devil butt. You know, you need to stand your ground, say, no, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And everything within me is going to fight you. Now, in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, many of you know this. And maybe you've heard it this way. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. That's the way that, that for most of us, we've, we've heard it. We've been raised up. And that's definitely good, you know. But, but what that tells us is that if we raise up a child in the way he should go, a lot of times we're raised thinking that, that what that means is that there is one standard, one way in which he can be raised. And, and that's got to be this particular law, this particular legal road here is the way that he can be raised. And then if I follow that and I keep him in that particular thing, then that particular way, then he's going to grow up perfect without any problems. But that's not what it says. In the amplified version, I'm going to draw your attention to that. It's really a good interpretation of it because it adds to it. That's what the amplified version does, right? And it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and in keeping with his individual gift or bent. And when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Oh, so that's an interesting little addition in there. In keeping with his individual gift or bent. 
Well, what we found years ago is that we needed to find out that it was a trick to find out what our child's individual gifting and bent was. And that's what your job is as a parent to do in order to be successful with this. Let me give you a little bit of background. I was uh, married years ago, and I actually, you know, I had, this is my daughter, my first daughter here is, is down here, Chantel. And from the, from, I was single for nine years after a divorce. And so I raised my daughter by myself from age three through age 12 when Sue and I got married when she was 12. And so through all of that nine years, um, you know, I really didn't have any problem raising her. God blessed me with a, a very compliant child. She ble he, he blessed me with someone who was a lot like me in temperament. And so we just got along great. You know, I mean, I, I was the artist type. She's the artist type. I was, you know, all, all of that. You know, we just, we got along good. We saw things the right way. I, I, you know, she liked to nature and things. And so I would take her camping with me and it was great. You know, we just, we got along good. And in fact, I would hear people talk as I got in the church and got involved in things. I'd hear people tell me, oh, it's so hard to be a parent. And I'd think, it is? Really? It's not hard for me. Uh, you know, and, and I thought that I had it all together. And I thought, man, for sure, I should be able to teach seminars on parenting. <laughs> because I just knew everything that there was. Because everything I did worked. Why? Because she was so much like me. <laughs> and I knew what it is that she was thinking before she ever, you know, even thought it or did it. And so that was really good. Well, then Sue and I got married. And then what happened was we ended up, we had our first child, Anna. And so all of a sudden, Anna came out of the womb crying and with a set of lungs on her. And I realized oh my gosh, what did we get into here? She wasn't, she had a strong will and she was, had a personality of her own that wasn't like mine. <laughs> of course, you know, she was ex exactly a duplicate of my wife, but you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, she had a very strong personality and, and from the very beginning, she uh, has always loved books. She always liked to have a microphone in front of her. She's into drama, all of those things. And so, of course, now as a profession, she's a teacher. And so, you know, she likes to be in front of people, always did. And so when we were children's pastors, it made the, the, uh, a venue for her really easy to give her opportunity to shine because she could come up and lead praise and worship. She could come up and do all of these things, and that was really great. And so we learned how to work with, with that. And, and she blessed us in our profession. She was able to come forth and, and enhance the children's program and things. And so it was, was really great. Well, then our third child came along, Joey. Joey. And when he started getting into uh, children's church, I was thinking he's going to follow along right with, with Anna. And he's going to just come along and, and uh, join in her, with her and, and be as excited about doing things up in front of everybody that, that she was. And he wasn't. Well, Anna would come in early in the morning and she would, she would uh, label all the seats exactly who was going to sit where. She was an organizer, you know, all that stuff. And, but then Joey would come in and all he wanted to do was sit in the back. And it was like, oh my gosh, what did I do? We must have really ruined our kids because he was so different than she was and they were both different than the first one was then somebody turned us on to a particular book and the book was called discovering your child your children's giftings discovering your children's gifts by don and katie fortune and we read it and we realized we started realizing that wow, we could find out there were some differences between our children. And, and what we did was we gave them all the, a test that was in the book. And I'm not here to just promote the book. But we gave them a test. We found out that their giftings were, were different. And, and Anna, for instance, was a, a prophet perceiver. And then we found that Joey was a ministry server. And so, wow, he liked to do things behind the scenes. And so we realized that that was where he was going to serve God was behind the scenes instead of being up in front. Sometimes we push our kids up front, especially when we're in leadership. We push our kids up in front and, and we, we think that they're only going to shine if they're up in front of things when in fact there's a whole sub 
church here that needs to be supported by faithful and, and capable and willing people. And so he, he was, you know, he would do the, the lights. He would, he liked to play the, um, play instrument and stuff. And so he was in the band and different things like that. But, but he never was one of, he, he, he's not a teacher type. And so we had to find out what it was that caused our children to grow the way that God had for them. And that's what I'm saying is that you realize that God has a specific gifting and a calling upon your children. And, uh, and you'll be that much farther ahead. Amen? Number two is you need to use your faith in raising your kids. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. And so I'd like to say parents shall live by faith. Because you need to know, uh, you know, Abraham back in the day, he's, he's said those things, he spoke those things which be not as though they were. And we need to realize that we need to walk, uh, even though our children may seem one particular way right now, we go to God and we get the promises of God on what he's promised us regarding our children. And then we stand and we put our feet firm in faith and we believe God for the change to take place if there's a change that needs to take place. But we need to see things for what they will be rather than see things for maybe how they are right at this moment. Amen? Uh, there's just a list here of, I've got just four different people that I wanted to bring to your attention because these were things that people prophesied negatively on them and yet they turned around and they changed the entire viewpoint. Now let me show you. Beethoven. You guys know who Beethoven is, right? The famous composer. His music instructor said that as a composer, he is hopeless. Well, okay. Aren't you glad that he didn't believe that? Thomas Edison, who invented the light bulb, the phonograph, the motion pictures. When he was a young boy, his teacher said that he was so stupid he couldn't learn anything. Boy, you know, and that's the, the bad part is that our kids will get labels like this when they're little. And then our job is to keep them focused on what we know that they can do and their strengths that they have. Walt Disney. You guys know a little place called Disneyland around here, right? Well, Walt Disney was once fired by a newspaper editor because he was thought to have no good ideas. <laughs> Louisa May Alcott author of Little Women, the book Little Women, she was told by her editor that she was incapable of writing anything that had popular appeal. Isn't that funny? Well, you know, you need to believe in your kids, and you need to believe, and you need to stand alongside of them, and even when nobody else believes, you need to believe, and you need to put your faith out there and walk in faith. The third thing that you need to do is you need to be an example yourself. You need to be an example. Your kids are going to mimic you. You're the only person, the only Jesus that they know, really, when they're little, is through you. And so they, they'll mimic you. They're going to follow you. They're going to do what it is that you are doing. And uh, there was a, I saw a recent post on Facebook that was kind of sad, but it had, had a picture of, uh, you know, it, it was a little video thing that um, was talking about this particular subject, and it had this woman walking down and she's carrying a cigarette in her hand and it has a little teeny boy behind her carrying a cigarette with her. And then it had, it continued to progress and it had everybody doing all these raunchy things, you know, naturally raunchy things, ending it with the final thing with a, a guy beating his wife. And it had, turns around and it has the little boy beating her too. You know, it was pretty sad. But the point that they were making in it was that kids will follow you. You are the example in front of your kids. And so what you need to do is you need to keep, you need to keep godly influences in front of them. What are you doing? Are you, when you're around them at home, are you praying in front of them so that they can hear? Or are you not doing anything? Are you dancing before the Lord when you are happy? Are you giving him thanks and praise? Are you reading your Bible in front of them? Are they seeing you do that? If they're not, then they'll see that it's not that important for you to do. Are you putting, instead of reading your Bible or instead of coming to church, are you going to a, a sports game or something instead? You know, what have you put as a point of importance? 
in the, uh, what are you watching on TV at night? Are you, uh, are you watching godly things and things that are G-rated or things that, that are healthy for your kids? Or are you sitting at home watching Law & Order SVU? I mean, what is it that you're watching? You know, it's, it's very important that we take stock of, of what we're doing as parents and realize that my child is watching everything that I do. They're watching the attitudes that I have. They're watching the, um, if I'm being negative about uh, something that Pastor Jim said in the church and I leave here and we're going to have lunch, we're going to go have Pastor Jim for lunch in front of your kids or whatever. I mean, I know nobody would ever do that, right? But the fact is, is that you need to be careful of what it is that you're doing because your kids will follow you as an example. Pastor C, you want to come on up? Amen. Good job. Am I on? I got the lapel. Okay. Do you want to take your binder away? Thank you. Well, that was good, honey. Good job. I was ready to just keep, keep listening to all that. That's good. Anyway, um, yes, parenting. Gosh, I've been enjoying this this series, haven't you? It's been so good, so good. Well, I I enjoyed. um, I've enjoyed every every week, but I enjoyed the panel last week. I enjoyed uh, uh, the few weeks before Pastor Deborah did a part one and part two, and and we've talked a lot about. um, discipline with children and spanking and all that, but um, we're going to look at a few things along those lines and really get specific because sometimes it's when we uh, assume people understand things that there's a lot of confusion. So um, I appreciate the verse that Pastor Mike used, Proverbs 22, 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go and in keeping with his individual gift or bent. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. That is so good. When they're old, that which you have sown in them at the earliest points in their life is that which is going to stay with them the longest. Amen? Well, um, we want to look at training up children a little bit more, and I'd like you to first look at this little uh, YouTube video that I think probably a lot of you have already seen. But um, I just want you to take a look, and we're going to see at uh, what can all too often be a typical scene. Um, in our society today. Do we have that? They can listen to me, listen to me. Like, like I do this all the time, and if I go out at the, at the house with the door, Matthew has his toys, and then Matthew has all his toys. Okay, but I have to yell at you guys. Okay, Linda, Linda, listen, 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 you. listen, listen, Linda, listen. Okay, what? Like everything they do at this house, it can touch everything at Grandma's house. Okay. Okay, then what? Then you're not listening to me. Then you're not listening to me. I asked you not to do something. No, no, but listen to me. Look at If we do something, if you get that out, that bird thing off, you're going to break it. Okay, but I'm asking, I'm letting you know but that you cannot. No, no, I'm. Li- lick it, lick it. You're not listening to me. Linda, listen to me now. Lick it, lick listen to me listen now. To, listen to me. No, you're not listening. I said no cupcakes, and you try to get cupcakes and you try to ask Grandma. Linda, Didn't you? Linda, lick it, lick it, lick it. If we do something right out, just a if you get close up, you can't even get them. You're going to burn your butt. What's going to burn your butt? No. You and Kevin don't listen. So I have to give both of you guys pop pals in your butt. But Linda, but Grandpa's going to give me pop pals in your butt. No, he's not. Yeah. I have to. You want? You don't want me to hit Kevin or you don't want me to spank you? No. Why? Because anybody don't want to spank me. And then I have to spank Kevin. But he's, the, but he's my little pop pops. He's your little pop ups, but he doesn't listen. But Linda, honey, honey, look at, look at this. Right now, you can't do anything if you can't get everything out of the wall. If you're gonna break everything down. I'm not breaking anything down. I'm just letting you know Linda, you cannot it, have it, cupcakes it, for dinner. It, Linda, Linda, like this thing, I never belong to you. Anything you can 
can get anything and anything and anything. I'm done arguing with you. I'm done arguing with you. You need to listen to the things that I say because I'm the mom and I'm the no, adult. No, look at, listen to me. All the time to get them to, to, to stink, to, to, to stink, to stink. Oh. Yeah. I'm done speak. arguing with you. No, no, I'm done arguing with you. Oh, <laughs> now we're laughing. We're laughing at him. And I, uh, I've heard they made some more videos. And he actually was on Ellen uh, lately. And uh, she gave him the cupcake he wanted. So he got rewarded for his bad behavior. <laughs> but uh, so we're laughing. But unless you know, God intervenes, the parents get their eyes open to the need for a little bit more discipline in that situation. He already thinks he's in charge at age about three. Do you get that picture? And from everything I've been reading, we've, we've gone from a, a parent-centered uh, view on raising children to a real child-centered view on raising children. And you have two and three-year-olds that decide whether they're going to go into the class to hear the Word of God. You have Two or three-year-olds decide what they're going to have for meals. You know, I talked to a parent that said that her three-year-old, she's, all, all he'll eat is McDonald's. How did he get there? How did he get there? You know, and, and so coming from our, our generation, it's just, it, it blows me away that at, many parents think at age two or three that the child has sense enough to run his life. And, and abdicates much of their responsibility as parents. And so um, there's some things I just want to share with you tonight that uh, is so clear in the Word of God that if you get the, everything in order, you're going to have a home that's full of the peace of God and the love of God, and you're going to have children that grow up to love God. Amen? Amen. So Pastor Mike shared the first three points. Number four, I'd like to say that we need to teach our children to respect authority. Do I hear an amen? Amen. We need to teach children to respect authority. In Matthew 8, Jesus um, said that, he was talking to the centurion. And the centurion said that um, he was a man that was under authority. And he had soldiers under him. And he said, Jesus, you know, you can just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus commended him because he said, you're one that understands authority. And if you look in the word of God, everywhere that, that um, God has moved among a people and a, and a generation and with the children of Israel. He always had lines of authority. In God, there is always a line of authority that has to be clear and has to be communicated. So number one, we need to teach children to respect God's authority. His, he is the final authority on conduct. Do I hear an amen? Amen. You know, our children, as Pastor Mike said, our children came from God. And the fact of the matter is, is someday they will stand before Him and they will answer to Him for their lives. And we have them on loan for just a very short time. And honestly, it might help some of you that have older teens and young adults to just step back and, and put some of that pressure back on God and say, God, you know they came from you? They're going back to you, you deal with them. And, and really, we, we kind of take it all on us, that it's all up to us. But he tells us what to do, and then if we do our part, then we need to cast our care on him, because he cares about them so much more than we do. Amen? They came from him, they're going to return to him. He is the father of all spirits. So we have to teach our children to seek first his kingdom. They need to see that He is first in our lives, as Pastor Mike shared, to be an example. That God is first with our week. He's first with our day. When we're making decisions, that we consult the Word of God first. As you're driving home from school, you've picked your kids up from school, and they're talking about a situation of the day. It should become your habit to say, well, gosh, I wonder what God's Word says about that. And that they hear you applying God's Word to the everyday situations of life. Because then that's how they're going to do life as an adult. Amen? This is our owner's manual. This is how we live life. Amen? Somebody said one time, well, I wish parenting came with a manual. It does! It comes with a manual. But we have to read the manual. 
You know, we were just blessed. We just bought a, a used Beamer, BMW. It's used, so don't judge. But anyway, <laughs> but uh, it came without the manual. One of those things when you buy used cars, as is. It came. So we had to download it off the internet. Praise God, you can do that in this day and age. But, um, you own a car, you need a manual to know how to run that car, what kind of oil to put in, when it needs, an, when it needs a, it to be serviced, right? So in raising your children, this is your manual. And so as parents, you can't get around it. You have got to be a student of the Word of God, where you spend at least a little bit of time every day going to God and going to the manual and saying, Father, show me what I should do about this situation. Show me what your word says. And you know what I love about the Holy Spirit? He is the teacher of the church. And he will, I tell you, sometimes I'm just thumbing through. Anybody just thumb through? And a scripture will literally pop out at me and it will be the wisdom that I need for, for a situation with my children. And so this is your manual and they need to see that you look to your life decisions, you look to the Word of God to see what it says and that you answer to God. And that will begin to instill in them the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 9, 10 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do we want our children to have wisdom? As parents, do we want our children to have wisdom? Do we want them to be not able, not a person that can't get a job someday, but as they step out into life to be sought after because of the great character and wisdom that they have? And so the fear of the Lord is the beginning of that wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so a fear of the Lord that, that your life is dependent on God, that they see you in humility turn to God and put Him first. And as Mike said, to be that example before them, that you always default to the Word of God. And many times when they're asking, well, why do we go to church? You should know why you go to church. Not just because you've always gone to church. Know that the Word of God says in Hebrews 10, 25, that we're not to forsake the assembling of the saints. When they say, well, um, you know, why should I read the Word of God, Mom? Why should I get into the Word of God? Well, because 2 Timothy 2.15 says that we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. And that Psalm 119.11 says that your Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. That they see that if they put the Word of God in them, it's going to keep them from sin as they grow older. Isn't that good? So we need to know why we do what we do. Amen? And then they need to have respect for you as the parent. You are the parent. The, the title of this message is, Who is the Parent? You are the parent. It's you. Everybody say, Hallelujah. And, um, but they need to respect you as the parent in the home, the authority in the home. There's actually an anger and an insecurity that can rest in a child that doesn't have a sense of, of, of uh, the boundaries and, and what is the expectations are in a home. Because deep inside they know you don't love me enough to help me manage myself. They know deep inside that they're a child and they don't know everything. And so when, it, when the rules change every day and it's up to what mood dad's in and whether mom's tired or not, and, and every day the rules change and there's an insecurity that, that grows with them that they've, they've always got to figure out where's dad's mood and what's mom up to. And, and there's not a clearly defined set of boundaries around them that they know what the expe expectations are. Many times there's an anger on the inside that they don't quite understand, but it's because they know you're not helping me with myself. Are you with me? Ephesians 6, 1 through 4 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then it says, now it's interesting that Paul wrote this to the Ephesian church, but this verse is written to children. So yeah, as soon as they can read, as soon as they're old enough, this verse is for them. It's not even written to you, it's written to them. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. God tells you, tells your children that they're to obey you. It doesn't say, try it, might be good, if Dr. Spock agrees, if it's the latest trend in psychology. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
Honor your father and mother, which is the first command with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Well, I love that it says that children are to honor their father and mother. So you have got to teach them to honor you, to show you respect. They're not going to automatically get it. Because as we've been learning in this church, we're all born with a fallen nature. And at a very young age, I believe your child is going to receive Jesus. But until then, and, and get a new nature, but even then once you're born again, you know, you have this old nature, kind of like a dead corpse that you still carry around. And every time, it, every now and then it resurrects. You, you know, you thought it was dead, but then it came alive right at that pressure point and you turned into a crazy person and then you had to repent. Are you with me? Are we on the same planet tonight? Where are we, am I in a, somebody else's church? Anyway. But it says that, that we're to teach them to honor their father and their mother. And I just want to t step aside here and say some of you are in situations where you're in a blended family or you've divorced and now th your children are at your house one weekend and at the, you know, your, your exes the next weekend or there's a shared custody there. But you still need to train your children to honor that parent. And I'll tell you, you're going to do your children a big favor if you don't diss your ex, if you honor your ex. He might not be perfect. She might be, you know, crazy woman. But you teach your children to show respect and honor to them because that is their father or there is their mother. And you're going to have a much better uh, emotionally adjusted child. That was free. But it says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. It's the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments. But it's the first one that attaches a promise to the commandment. It says that it may be well with you, that it may be well with your children if they'll just honor you. It's going to be well with them, and they're going to live long. I remember when my kids were little, sometimes when I was, we were having intense fellowship. I would say, do you want to live well? Do you want to live long? Anyway. That's more the, the teenager getting their face look, you know. But, um, and then it says fathers are not to pro provoke their children to wrath. Um, we're talking about um, firm but loving parenting here. We're not talking about anything done in anger. But this is a, a promise that's got, that God has given. That if you will teach your children to honor you and respect you, they're going to live well because they understand authority in their life, you're that first line of authority, authority that they're going to ever get. And they're going to live long. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? So let's talk about discipline a little bit. Let's talk about discipline. When we're talking about discipline, and we're talking especially about the area of, of spanking, what's called corporal punishment, we're talking about things that are willful defiance, not childish irresponsibility. You know, your child is going to forget their coat at school because they're a child, right? They're going to do dumb things because they're a child. They're not an adult. So things that are just in the area of just being a kid, that's, that's being a kid. And so you nag them. You're like a broken record. You know, you nag, you nag, you nag. And eventually they do get it. But, um, but when that flesh rises up and there is that defiance that they clearly know the rule and they're in your face going, no then until they can hear the Holy Spirit for themselves, there has to be a consequence that they understand that that is not acceptable. Are you with me? And so we want to talk about this area of spanking. Proverbs 13, 24 says, He who spares his rod of discipline hates his son. This is the Amplified. He who spares his rod of discipline hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines diligently and punishes him early. You know, um, you'll see that little, that no thing. You know, twos love that word no. They discover it and then it's no all the time. And, um, and, and uh, you'll see in the little booklets we gave you, you know, uh, James Dobson is, is one that has written, he's a Christian psychologist. He's written many books and stuff, but especially dealing with the strong-willed child. The compliant child, the easy natured child, you tell them no and they go, yes, mommy, yes, daddy. But how many of you don't have children like that? 
And um, I know my, my husband was talking about our daughter, Anna. She's, she's precious and she's a strong leader and we love her. But when Anna was little, no just meant try harder. You know, you said no and it's like, oh really? Oh, that must mean I, that's something I wanna try. And so, um, so there had to be some backing. But if you begin this early on, most of the spanking, the need for spanking is, is almost over by the time they're even really in school. It, you, it, the focus is about, you know, age two to, to 10 at the oldest. But um, I know with our kids, it was more like around a year, 15 months that it seems like they got that first uh, good one. But, um, but it says that if you'll diligently punish them early, that you're going to see some great, great results. And, and we were talking the other day and Anna goes, you know, she says, mom, I know you guys talk about spanking, but I really don't even remember Harley being, uh, getting a spank. And that was because, you know, before the age of four, you really don't remember too much. So you do your homework early on and a, a respect for your authority is instilled in that child and you're not gonna have to do a whole lot. As, as it gets easier and easier as you get older. And then as you get older, as they get older, sometimes you, you know, hit them where it hurts, like you unplug their electronics or, or deny privileges and there's other creative ways. But um, in talking about um, how to spank, um, First of all, I want to read this uh, article because many, uh, the question that we get a lot over in children's ministry is that there's a feeling that it's against the law. And let me be clear here. We are not talking about beating children. We are not talking about child abuse. And, and we're as strong of an advocate on the side of children as, as anyone around here. Um, we are not talking about child abuse. And in fact, most studies prove that if there is not godly, um, consistent spanking that goes on to where there's clearly defined rules in a home and there's peace and order in a home, that many times that's what opens the door to child abuse later. Because when the children are totally out of control, finally when they're about, you know, six to eight and they're just, you know, running roughshod over their parents, many times that's when a dad or a mom will just lose it and haul off and go crazy. And that's not godly. Are you with me? So if you have a major temper, you have a major anger issue, I would like to invite you to take anger management. Right, Pastor Joel? Is it Monday nights? Tuesday nights? Get into anger management. You get control of yourself. And we're not talking about anything that's done in anger. We're talking about obeying the Bible and doing what God says to do. Amen? But I want to read to you so we're clear. The California Penal Code 273D PC says, it says that this law defines child abuse as the willful infliction of a cruel or inhumane corporal punishment or an injury that results in a traumatic condition, and they define that later. Simply put, this means that you may be charged with California child abuse if you intentionally harm a child and it results in a visible or internal injury. And that says you don't have to cause the child great bodily injury or harm, even a minor injury can trigger this charge. But then later in explaining, and this is an explanation for uh, social workers, the social worker gave this to me, and this is an explanation that helps them you know, decide if it's an abusive situation. It says spanking, quote unquote, a child is typically excluded from California child abuse law as parents do maintain a right to discipline their children reasonably in the manner they see fit. So I just wanted to clear the air on that one. Then there is the Welfare and Institution Code, section 300 to 304.7. And let me just read part of, it, you, part of it to you. For purposes of this subdivision, quote, serious physical harm does not include reasonable and age appropriate spanking to the buttocks where there is no evidence of serious physical injury. Are you with me? What we're talking about and our pastors have done a great job of studying on the word rod. It says not to, to uh, uh, what? Not to spare the rod, to use the rod. And um, one translation says a reed-like rod. Um, they, what, uh, when Pastor Deborah was studying, she believed, and her, her and Pastor Jim believed that it was talking about 
a twig. When I was a little boy, we had this willow tree. I hated that willow tree. We had to go get our own branches off that willow tree. And it was just like, oh, it was the longest trip out to that willow tree and back. But I had read after James Dobson and some others, and my kids were little, and they advocated a little wooden spoon. So we had a little wooden spoon, and I had a smaller version I carried in my purse. And in Walmart, all I had to do was show them the end of it. <laughs> the little. And there was a scripture that says, it, it actually, I, we give it to you in that little uh, brochure we passed out. It says, if you beat them with a rod, they will not die. And so I used to tell my kids that, well, that was my favorite scripture. If you beat them with a rod, they will not die. You'll deliver their souls from hell. Now, anyway, but, um, but, but let me tell you what spanking is not. Spanking is not whacking them as they run by on three inches thick of diaper. That does nothing. It's not hitting them on the head. It's not punching them on the arm. And that's what a social worker or someone, a, a, a child protection person is going to look for. They're going to look for bruises in the wrong places. But when you've been very clear about what your sh child should or should not do, and they willfully defy you and say, no, not going to do that, and that ugly rebellion rises up in them, then it's over the lap or over the bed, pants down, little bare buttocks. That's why God gave your children bottoms. <laughs> and a little, a little, uh, Switch off the tree. I'm not talking about electrical switches. I'm not talking about belts that fly around with belt buckles. I'm talking about a little switch or a little wooden spoon. And usually one, one good swat gets them dancing. And if they rear up and they've still got that spirit on them, one more. And then you know when that spirit is broken over them because the tears come down. They're, they're, that, that thing that wants to rise up that rebellious spirit to defy your authority is broken. And then, and you're not angry while you do that. If you're angry, if what they did just made you so angry, you go take a time out. You rest. I used to keep mine in the kitchen drawer, so I had to walk there to get it. And if I was a little angry when I did it, I said, you know, mommy should have spanked you because, you know, what you did was wrong, but I wasn't supposed to get angry, so I'm going to ask Jesus to forgive me too. And then you pray, you ask Jesus to forgive him, you hug him, and then it's over. You don't go on and on about it all day when your husband comes home. You don't rant about it for another 30 minutes. It's over. Because when God forget, for, forgives us, does he forget it? Yes, it's over. It's over. And it reaps that peaceable fruit of righteousness. The same hands that took that little rod and hug, and, and there should be that closure afterwards, that you hug them and you love them. And you say, now, is, you know, are you going to obey mommy next time? Yes. You know, and, uh, and you grow in the Lord with that. Amen? Are you good? Are you good? Number five, teach your children to rule over their flesh and over sin. Until your child can hear the Holy Spirit for themselves, you've got to play Holy Spirit. And so you are the one that, that learns the Word of God and instills that in them to help them rule over their flesh and over sin in their life. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he who keeps the law, happy is he. What you need to do when your children are young, and you can do this actually any, any stage along the way, is to step back and in prayer, let God show you, as Pastor Mike uh, shared, you know, what your child's giftings are, or to get a vision for the end product. What you, how you want your child to be someday. Do you want them to be a responsible citizen? They're going to have to be responsible to pick up their toys. Or do you want them to be well-mannered? You're going to have to teach them manners. You, you are it. You are the parent. And so get a vision for how you want your child to be someday as an adult. Do you want them to have wisdom? Do you want them to make wise choices? Do you want them to um, pick their friends uh, wisely? Are you with me? And so once you have that instilled in your heart, then when they are acting otherwise, you are the keeper of that vision. And you help bring their, their, um, their character in line. You know, I looked at where God first spoke to the first children on the planet. He spoke to Cain. And it was in Genesis 4, 6 through 7. And it says, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? He was jealous of his brother. 
And why do you look sad and depressed and dejected? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin crouches at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. So one thing that we need to do as parents is to help our children be able to take authority over their flesh, not yield to the lust of the flesh, but to listen to their spirit and to obey God. Are you with me? Well, I, I uh, sent off a question to our youth pastors and I asked them, what are some things that you, we can do to help um, parents of teens? I knew that we weren't going to be spending the whole time on this, but I did want to have some help for those of you that have teens and young adults, or, or teens especially that are, that are underage, they're still living in your home, and obviously if you're paying the electric bill and you've got uh, young adults living in your home, the rules still apply. Amen? If they're 18 and you still support them financially, what is adult about their lives? Anyway, that was free. But um, anyway, I sent off a letter to her, or an email to her, to ask her what they would suggest. And there's two um, internet parent control um, sites that you can go to that can help you put a parental control on your computer and on, on their phones and all that, anything that's got an internet access. There's Triple X Church. And that's great because if your kid's really savvy and he's a little hacker and he tries to turn off that parental control, yeah, it'll alert you. You know, so um, I know I was looking, doing research on uh, cheer, cheerleading costumes for a, a certain event one time and my husband got a notice that somebody was on the computer looking at pictures of cheerleaders. So that's how good it is. Anyway, it was me, it wasn't my son. So, um, and then uh, another one is called Covenant Eyes. But this is what she said, this is what Pastor Michelle said, and I thought it was so eye-opening because, again, we're, we're kind of from a different generation. It says, we suggest kids turn cell phones into parents at night, and please, parents, please check their cell phones, texts, Facebook, Snapchats, internet history, etc. It is almost, listen to this, it is almost considered second base now for kids to send nude pictures of each other to their boyfriend or their girlfriend. That's considered, you know, getting to second base. You send a nude picture to each other. I know that's shocking and horrible, but parents need to be aware. This is what's going on out there. You can call your cell phone provider to limit what phone calls they can call. You can limit times that they can call. She said, many times teens will stay up all night on their phones or their Xbox and not get enough sleep to be able to do well in school. You've got to have some limits there. Are you with me? Parents need to check anything with an internet access, like an Xbox, a tablet, an iPod touch, etc. She said, also, a little neat thing available on cell phones is called Find My Friends. And a parent can turn this on and find where their teen is at all times. It's a GPS. So if your teen says that they're with one group of friends at one house, you can really find out if they're there. That's nice. And it says it's also helpful uh, at Disneyland if you're trying to find each other. So anyway, um, and then I thought this was, was really cute. Um, now what a lot of parents are doing, they actually are uh, having a contract and you can, you can go online and, and there's some samples, different samples online, but you have your, your teen sign a contract for use with their cell phone. If you're paying for the cell phone, they play by your rules. Amen? And, um, and I thought this was really cute. John, if you could put it up. This is a way to get some things done around the house. In order to get today's Wi-Fi password, you can change that password every day. In order to get today's Wi-Fi password, Empty the dishwasher, fold the laundry, vacuum downstairs, and take out the trash. Yeah. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Isn't that good? So you can still have authority in your home. Are you with me? You can still have authority in your home. And number six, be a loving but firm parent. Be a loving but firm parent. As much as I emphasize discipline and, and firmness on one side, on the other side, talk to your kids. I always say, keep them talking especially through junior high, senior high, keep them talking. Talk to your kids. There should be times that you just talk 
And if you've been kind of going at it and they don't like your rules and da da da, you know, let your hair down and just go walking in the mall or do something that they want to do that, that is more lighthearted and continue to keep the ties of your relationship uh, connected and, and, and be affectionate. Oh, I cannot tell you how many facts I've, I've uh, read and I, I don't have time to go into it. But be affectionate with your children. You can, so many times you can gauge where they're at. If they kind of pull away from you, uh-oh, something's going on. There should be lots of hugs from dads to daughters, lots of hugs from moms to kids. You know, my, I, we've been picking on Anna today, but just by nature, she was a little more independent. You know, I would be sitting in the nursery and all these kids would just be all snuggly in their mom's laps and everything. And, and Anna would be looking around for, who's here? And she want, you know, and I would go, she loves me, she really does. But, um, but I'd make her hug me and I'd grab her, you're gonna hug me. You know, and again, every child's different, but every child needs that affection. They need to know that they're okay with you. And as we say around here so much, uh, um, love and approval are often two different things. They might be doing some things right now as, as older teens, young adults that you're in their face and you're not real happy about, but you love them. And so you're gonna hug them, you're gonna spend time with them, you're gonna do whatever it takes to keep your relationship connected. Are you with me? So number one, recognize that your children are a gift from God. Use your faith in raising your children. Be an example, teach your children to respect authority, to rule over their flesh, and then be a firm but loving parent. Most of all, be the parent. Did you get something tonight? Well, since we're talking about relationships, before we leave and go out and, and um, partake of the snacks that are outside, um, I just wanted to give you guys an opportunity here. If you are in this place, I know it's running a little bit late, but if you're in here tonight, and you would say, Pastor Mike, you talk about relationships, you talk about fathers and things, but, you know, I don't know where I would go if I were to die tonight. If you were to die tonight and get in your car and drive away and, you know, I mean, where, where is it that you would open up your eyes? Would you be in heaven or would you be in hell? You know, it's really an important thing for you to decide because, you know, you've come into church tonight, you've... You've been here, you've, you've heard the Word of God, you've heard the Word of God concerning parenting, but you've, you've heard the Word of God in general, and you need to realize that it only works if you are a Christian, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And it's, very, it's, it's just an important thing for you to know that you belong to a family, a family of God. It would be uh, a horrible thing if you were to leave and not know where it is that you were going to open up your eyes. And you might say, well, I think I'm a Christian. I, I believe I am, really. I, I, you know, I've been coming to church for a while, and, and you know, maybe I went, you know, my mom, my dad brought me to church as I grew up, but, um, you know, I think that I am. Well, I got news for you. The Bible doesn't it says that there's, there's, that's not how you know that you're a Christian. It's not just from coming to church. It's not just from having Christian parents. And it's not from being around a bunch of Christian people. The Bible says that in order for you to become a Christian, you have to give him your heart and your life. And that's called being born again. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes to, he was a, a, a Rabbi, and he came to Jesus and he said, what, Master, what is it that I need to do to inherit the kingdom? And he said, Nicodemus, you've done all these other things, because Nicodemus was a good guy, but he says, you've done all these other things, but Nicodemus, you need to be born again. And he's, you know, not, didn't quite understand what that meant. But this is what it means. Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said that if you come to him and you give your heart to him, you'll live forever. So that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. Or maybe you've never ever done that. Maybe because, you know, you just have never been put in that position to where you've had to make that decision. 
to make it final once and for all that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is your Lord, your Savior, and where you're going to spend eternity. What I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three. I'm going to clap my hands together. And at the count of three, when I clap my hands together, if you are in here in this place and you can't honestly say that you ever remember praying and receiving and asking Jesus to come into your heart, then I'm going to ask for you to raise up your hand. You say, well, Pastor Mike, I might be embarrassed about doing that. Yeah, you might be. But you know what? It'll only be for a moment. What's a little moment of embarrassment to make sure once and for all that you're spending eternity in heaven? You know, what is that embarrassment? So on the count of three, if you're in here today, if you've been thinking about God and, and you know, you've never really given that, your heart to him, then on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand up. Maybe you've been messing around with God. You know, you haven't been serious about him, but you know that you need to make sure once and for all that your relationship is right with him. Then raise your hand up. Maybe you have been thinking that, you know, I can just come and I could, I could do my own thing. But now you realize that that's not the case. You need to make a, a firm commitment for Jesus. You need to be born again. If that's you tonight, I'm going to give you that opportunity on the count of three. One, two, three. If you're in here, I see that hand. Are there any others that would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord? I see that hand. That's two. Any others? Three. Any others? Okay, I see that hand. In the family room back there, I see. Okay. Well, this is what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to have everybody stand up, and I'm going to ask you to be bold. And I'm going to ask you to come forth at this time. Once uh, Everybody go ahead and stand up. We're going to sing a song. And when we sing this song, I want you to come forth. I want you to grab your, your uh, purse if you're a woman and, or your child or, or you know, a friend if you need to. Bri you know, bring your things down. And I want you to come on up here to the front, and I'm going to shake your hand. When you come up here, and then we're going to uh, we're going to pray, we're going to believe with you for your salvation. Amen. Just as I front. am without one plea, but that Thy blood was shed for me, and that Thou biddest me come to Thee. Oh, Lamb of God, I come Just as I am without one plea But that thy blood was shed for me And that thou biddest me come to thee, O oh, Lamb All right, well, you know, this is the best decision that you've made is to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. I want to introduce you to Pastor Joel. This is Pastor Joel here. And he's going to take you into a room over here. It's not going to do anything weird. You know, it's don't worry about just because you're going over there. You know, he won't beat you up for very long. No, I'm just kidding. He, he, you know, he's, he's a good guy, and he's got some things he wants to give you. He wants to give you a little book and, and some things. And you know what? Most importantly is that we believe here at The Rock, that if we can have one year, if you will give yourself and, and set aside one year to grow in the things of God, you know, it would be the best year spent in your entire life. You know, you, you'll never be the same. This year will change your entire life, your entire future. And so, you know, we help you get through that. The first couple of weeks, we, we, if you wish, you know, we can hook you up with a spiritual personal trainer, an SPT, somebody, you know, that can help you, like in a, 
you know, personal trainer in the natural will build you up, you know. Well, this guy or woman will get you to where you get focused on the things of God and change the way that you're thinking, the way that you do life right now. All right? Well, anyway, Pastor Joel, he will lead you in the prayer of salvation in there, and he will uh, give these things to you. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.